This session is co being co-sponsored uh, by the Center and by the African Studies uh, Program here at Georgetown. Again, one of those new innovations. <laughs> in uh, so, does anybody have any questions or comments? You might identify yourself and keep comments and questions short. Yes. My name is Amin, and I'm very interested in religion, but also psychology and anthropology, and I just love what you do. Wonderful. Very much. Uh, some of the readings that I've done in anthropology yes. and psychology, I love Jung, but I also love Campbell, uh, is about the shamanic journey. And I think about Africa mm. as having shamanic roots. There's an earlier kind of visionary roots, and Islam comes into it, it's there first. And I love how the way things merge. But the shaman's journey, there are two levels of it. One is an ascent. Mm -hmm. Usually pictured as climbing the axis of the universe, or the tree of the universe, whether it's the bow tree or Muhammad going up the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, where there's some interaction with God's God. The other is descent, yeah. where there's a fragmentation of the journey. And often, after the fragmentation, they're put back together. I remember you said they labeled every bone, he knew every bone. And they bring back a boon which is a healing for their group in that time, their tribal group. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is this pattern that he brings back this boon about nonviolence mm -hmm. to this particular community. So mm -hmm. he is their medicine person. I don't know what the better honorable word is. I, am, I also studied Sufism. Sure. So the Sheikh the sur descends into this overworld, but then goes into an underworld to go through the actual initiation of the, of the beatings and the imprisonment, but comes back with a vision for his community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lovely question. Um, the, the piece that I would recommend uh, to you that would give you a more satisfactory answer for what you asked than anything that I've written is a book that is just about to come out, and I know because <laughs> I'm one of the reviewers for the press on this book, um, by a brilliant young scholar named Oludamini Obunaike who has written, um, uh, he's, a, he's trained as a philosopher, and he's written a study that um, compares and also puts into dialogue um, the tradition of uh, Tijani Sufism, uh, especially in Senegal, and to, but to a lesser extent in northern Nigeria, and um, Ifa divination um, in Yoruba society. So he talks about what the epistemological shared common ground is between these two different religious traditions. Um, so I think that his answer about um, how you see relationships between that shamanic journey um, and the, the Islamic one uh, would be better than mine. And the reason for that is, is that I actually, as a, as a rule, tend to shy away from looking for um, local uh, pre-Islamic origins for much of what I see in Islamic religious culture in West Africa. Um, precisely because certain narratives about the history of Islam in Africa um, portray African Islam as being by definition syncretistic um, because Africans have to kind of naturally be pagan and therefore whenever they accept Islam it has to be mixed with something else. So I'm, the per I'm not the person that, that thinks through these, uh, these distinctions most carefully and I strongly recommend that book. And I'll add one other piece. Um, and and this, this can actually help you because this one's published. It's not, you don't have to wait six months for it to come out. Um, and that's from the Journal of Religion in Africa um, from 2000. Um, Lewis Brenner has a really nice piece that's called Histories of Religion in Africa, which is a terrible title because it doesn't tell you anything about what's in the article. It's a wonderful article. And it's actually about the relationship between divinatory practices in Islamic West Africa and non-Islamic uh, divinatory practices. And I think that it provides the model for exactly the kind of analysis that, 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 that you're proposing. Yeah, because what you say also about dreams, dreams often come from, I, I would say, mm -hmm. just come from a lower stratum that even goes beyond civilizations. It's mm -hmm. almost like they're built one upon another, but the unconscious mind doesn't get stuck in one of the other. Yeah, um, but I'll, and, I'll, and the only thing I'll just, and the last thing I'll say about that is that it's important to understand that for, for these visionaries, um, the mind um, doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, That's what I'm saying. So, so the, <laughs> that, the, the, the instrument that receives the, the dream, the, it, that receives the inspiration, is the heart, not the mind. And even Muslim philosophers sometimes get themselves into conundrums in this way um, because they, they think of a thing called the aql, the, the intellect or the reason, uh, sometimes translated as mind. 
Um, but the Quran itself does not use the term aql as a noun. It uses aql as a verb. Uh, intellection or reasoning or understanding, but the thing that does the akala in, the thing that does the intellection, yeah, sorry about that, the thing that does the intellection is the heart. And the heart is where the vision that cannot be encompassed by the senses has to, to, to take place. In more academic, Please. in a more academic sort of context as well, uh, it, it works with what is the nature of the knowledge yes. that is being utilized and experienced. Yes. And so that it, there is this inter really lovely distinction between Akli understanding and Nakli understanding. Yes. You know, sure that, that there is some understanding that you get from your intellect, but there is other, uh, the Nakli is the, the kind of transmitted yeah. and received knowledge, and that would be the vision. That's right, it. wonderful. Question, comment. Thank you for your talk. My pleasure. I'm Nahid Kabir. I'm a visiting researcher at the center. Okay. So it's uh, about the murid. We say it's six million. Yeah, uh, give around. or take. Yeah. So is it more regional, like Africans and Africans living overseas, or it has spread to South Asia? It's an excellent question. So the, with respect to the muridia specifically, it, the vast majority uh, of murids live in Senegal. And um, the, there's a, a Murid diaspora in pretty much every major city of, throughout the world. Um, but relatively small communities of converts to the Muridiyya within those local environments. So the Muridiyya tends to be um, uh, largely Wolofone people that speak the, 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 the Wolof language. Um, and, and that's the example that I use for this talk because we can't talk about all of the figures that, that people that figure in the book. Um, but the, 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 the main figure that I discussed in the chapter, not on seeing the prophet, but on seeing God, is uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Yas, who founded a religious movement, um, the, the Fayda Tijaniya, that has, depending on who you ask, something like 60 million, not six, 60. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they're spread in every country in West Africa and in, in many countries around the world, including you know Albania and South Africa and uh, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia and every major American city, um, especially um, uh, Detroit and Chicago, but also uh, New York. So that there, there are other um, West African Sufi movements that are sort of more exp express explicitly proselytizing uh, kind of in their approach than the movie. In the back. Okay. Yeah, I'll Oh, hi, Alvin. Yeah. Good um, to see you again. Nice to see you again as well. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I had a question, though, about the um, how do we how do Moradia think of like the command that you know this is not the time to sh the time to shed blood is yeah. how do we think of like, is it a universal command something that should be understood like throughout all time or is it kind of conditional or bounded and yeah. is it only for them or for everyone so so uh, Bamba like every other classically trained scholar um, can't make legal rulings on the basis of visions <laughs> so it's not possible. For, um, for this to be a legally binding injunction that he would want to enforce on other Muslim communities. But it is an ethically binding injunction <laughs> carried by the weight of his own spiritual and intellectual authority. And I say intellectual authority because, and actually it's one of the things that I, I need to, 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 to more carefully research. He also writes a legal opinion, and I need to know whether the legal opinion comes before or after. No, actually I know, it, it comes after. Um, probably about 10 years after the, the, this, this vision, he writes a legal opinion that, that, um, that makes explicit the legal case against armed resistance to the, to the French, to French occupation. Um, and the, because most legal scholars in the Maliki legal tradition will say that physical resistance is incumbent uh, in the face of an occupying force, even if you're outnumbered two to one. Um, and the opinion that Bamba and, and actually several other scholars craft is that because of the, the, the difference in force and weaponry, um, you can't calculate in that way. So the, I mentioned Umd mm -hmm. earlier, those, there were 20,000 casualties suffered on the African side, 271 casualties suffered on the European side. That's more than two to one <laughs> difference. And so he wrote, uh, they, they, the argument was that Islam forbids suicide. Mm -hmm. So you can't uh, re, uh, make armed resistance. But it's, it's an important you know, distinction. It means making an argument that's ethical um, about the, the time for spilling uh, blood being over uh, and spiritual, um, and it, but it's not one that can be 
legally binding from the standpoint of the, of the city. Yes. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Peace be unto everyone in attendance. Um, I think it's safe to assume that we are amongst academics who are aspiring to be intellectual. And something, and something was mentioned that may defy logic. So I uh, would like you to expound on the casting of the prayer rug and the praying upon waves from a perspective that would be appreciated by the aspiring intellectual. Wow, that is a wonderful question. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's like, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assure you that he's not a plant, because I really wanted to, I really wanted to go further into that. Um, and he gave me the opportunity. Does anybody have a book of matches? A lighter? I'm gonna give you guys a lesson that answers the question, and it was a lesson that was given to me. Nobody has, nobody has, uh, nobody has a light? We're all virtuous. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit that they're a smoker. That's the problem. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, the way that I'll answer your question is the way that I begin my Islam in Africa class at the University of Michigan every year. This is the last thing that I do on the first day of class, which is I give a lesson that was given to me by one of Ahmed Obama's grandsons in 2002 in the city of Tuba. So I was interviewing people for my dissertation on the history of Quran schooling, and I, I interviewed him for like an hour or so, but what I would always ask people is, um, is there anything that you wanted to tell me that I didn't think to ask about? And so uh, Abdullah Mbaki, he said, yes, there's one thing. He walked over to his dresser and he tore a piece of paper out of a book, and then he got um, a, a match, and he lit the match, and he put it to the edge of the piece of paper, and I'm like, what is going on? And, so <laughs> and the fire starts to burn the piece of paper up until it's lapping at his knuckles, and then he drops it on the ground and he puts it out with the sole of his foot. And then he looks me in the eye and he says, Lan mo naka kaiti. What burned the paper? And I literally do this at the end of the first day of class every year in Islam in Africa. I ask my students, so I'll ask you now, what did I say when he said, what burned the paper? What's the answer? The fire. I said, the fire burned the paper. He said, that's what you think, but it isn't so. So I was puzzled and I said, well, well what burned the paper? He said, Yalla Mokalak. God burned it. <laughs> he said, this is how my, gra uh, my uh, grandfather, Ahmed Bamba, taught Tawheed, Islamic theology. He said, if you think fire, acting on its own, burned that paper, then you're an unbeliever which hurt my feelings because I had just said <laughs> I had just said that the fire burned the paper. Uh, but whatever, okay. Uh, so then uh, he said, if you think that God applied some force that we call fire to the paper causing it to burn, um, he said, Gumga yalla, why sa gumbi desna? He said, you believe in God, but your faith is incomplete. You believe in God, but you don't know who he is. Because it's as though you think that God is dependent on a force that we call fire in order to cause paper to burn. And the first lesson in Tawheed is to understand that God is independent of everything in creation and everything in creation is dependent upon him. He continued. He said if he wanted to, we could be having the conversation we're having right now and suddenly be suspended in outer space and keep right on talking. He said he could lop the heads off of live human beings they would go out, go to their jobs, go to the market on the way home, come home, do their business with their spouses, and go back out the next day, all without heads. God is not bound by the rules that he puts in place for the functioning of the universe. And now I get to your point. And he said, so if you hear stories about my grandfather praying on the ocean, on top of the ocean, understand that his conception of Tawheed was such that he knew that whether he was on dry land, suspended in outer space, or on the surface of the water, it was only the hand of God that held him there. That there is a station of yaqeen, of certainty, that causes you to perceive this perishable world as completely unreal. And you become just like Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> that if you see the Matrix as code, then the bullets entering your body doesn't do anything to you. You can stop them with your will at the hand because you know that they're not real. And there's a, the, and I connect this in the, in the book to, to a story that's told 
um, by Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the, the, the great jurist, uh, um, who relates some of the Islamic teachings about Jesus. So in one of his narrations, he says that um, a group of Pharisees came to Jesus, peace be upon him, and said, um, how is it that you perform your miracles, such as walking on the water, multiplying the food, and raising the dead? And he said, bil yaqeen, through certainty. <laughs> and they said, we too have certainty, but we find ourselves unable to walk on water and raise the dead. <laughs> And what he said was, is, is a pile of sand, a pile of rocks, and a pile of gold all the same in your sight? And they said, of course not. And he said, it is in mine. If it's all fake earth, <laughs> if it's not really real, if you can convince yourself at a cellular level of the irreality of this so-called reality, <laughs> then it no longer has any purchase upon you and that you can, with God's permission, transcend the ordinary rules that would apply. It doesn't happen all the time because God is not capricious, but it's something that he can bestow upon anyone who purifies themselves ethically and spiritually and who seeks God and his messengers and prophets out of love. And that's the, that's the answer. I get to write up the last question. Yes. You, 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 just, a, just a couple of minutes. But it's my you, great honor. You actually. depend, as do the people that you're talking about, on narrative. Mm -hmm. That you, you, that every, every, every explanation you give is a narrative. That's right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story. Yes. In your f analytical framework, what is the relationship between the narrative yes. and the language of the narrative and the vision? Because not everybody has visions. The Marids depend upon the narrative of the vision, not the vision. Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the relationship between narrative and vision as you see it? I think that you've actually just given me uh, the answer to your, to your own question. <laughs> Um, I, I gave a talk not unlike this one to the Comparative Literature Luncheon mm -hmm. at Penn State University last week. This is my third week, weekend in the row on the road. Um, my wife is a very patient woman. Um, and one of the things that, that, because it was a comparative literature group, they were very interested in these narratives. Mm -hmm. And because the book is, fin is not finished yet, I don't. I, I know what the pieces are, and I know but what you the don't overall. Know the the no, no. But actually, I think that I, I think that you just gave it to me. Uh -huh. I think that 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 the missing middle term, the the kind of transitive principle, so to speak, between the vision and the social reality, mm -hmm. the intermediary term between those two definitions that I had up on the screen right. at the beginning, is the narrative. Yep. So. Um, do I pay you for that, or how, how, how does this work? <laughs> since, since you've just completed the argument, that, that's, that's actually, okay, uh, we'll work it out. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for coming.